Okay. Hello, and welcome to the Global Leaders Dialogue, an event organized by the UN Population Fund, UNFPA, to mark the 20th anniversary of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. I'm Dominique Day. I chair the UN uh, Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, a fact-finding body mandated by the UN Human Rights Council to investigate and report on the situation of people of African descent globally. Our theme today, People of African Descent, A Journey Toward Equality, focuses specifically on the progress and challenges and implementation of the Durban Program of Action. This includes, in particular, efforts to ensure the social, political, economic, and cultural rights of people of African descent. It is my honor to moderate this dialogue with a group of superstars, whom I will take a moment to introduce now. First, Dr. Natalia Kenham. Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund. Ms. Susana Baca, former Minister of Culture of Peru, was a singer, songwriter, and activist with cultural interests. His Excellency, Excellency Professor, His Excellency Professor Gerardo Maloney, a former ambassador who's a sociologist, writer, educator, Panamanian filmmaker, and activist. Professor Hillary, Sir Hilary Beckles, a distinguished academic, international thought leader, UN committee official, and global public activist in the field of social justice and minority empowerment. Dr. Marta Morena Vega, a respected scholar, producer, activist, educated author, professor, Yoruba priestess, and founder of the Caribbean Cultural Center, Africa Dias African Diaspora Institute. And Ana Paula Barreto, uh, activist and researcher on the intersections of race, gender, global health, and the arts. She's the Transnational Birth Equity Director for the National Birth Equity Collaborative. So let's open this dialogue with remarks from UNFPA Executive Director, Dr. Natalia Kenham. Dr. Kenham, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Dominique, for the introduction and also for the work that you are doing towards equality. I'd also like to thank everyone who's joining us, especially online virtually. This dialogue promises to be very exciting. And I'm happy, I'm very happy to be here among the esteemed panelists. This is a conversation that is timely. It's a conversation that is much needed. And the road ahead must lead to a world that is more just, more equitable. That is the future we all want for people of African descent. I extend a special work welcome to the esteemed panelists. Very proud to have Vice Chancellor Sir Hillary, Professor Maloney, Dr. Marta Vega, Ana Paula Barreto, and of course, Susana Baca, who has been a keeper of the flame of Afro-Descendiente musical traditions. Really delighted to be here with all of you. Distinguished participants, dear friends, last week was a wonderful, momentous, unforgettable occasion for people of African descent and for the journey that we are taking to advance in the spirit of recognition, in the spirit of justice, and of development. What I saw was that spirit unwavering during the first ever International Day for People of African Descent, which I celebrated in Costa Rica, where we honored the extraordinary cultural contributions of the African diaspora, and reinforced the urgent need to take action to end racism, to end marginalization, and the systemic discrimination of people of African descent. And just last month, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution. It establishes the permanent forum of people of African descent. The General Assembly did this unanimously during a high-level meeting marking the midterm review of the international decade of for people of African descent, which ends in 2024. And we are building momentum as this decade comes to a conclusion. We need to engage in dialogue, such as we are today, 
regarding where do we go from here through 2024 and beyond. How do we move from words on the page towards action, action that's accelerated, and how do we harness our collective efforts and gather others to join us as we deliver the future we want? So this dialogue is going to explore these questions. We're going to examine our progress, but also take stock of what needs to be done towards full implementation of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action that was adopted 20 years ago at the landmark World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa. So I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas, your thoughts, your contributions, as together we continue a collective quest for justice, for equality, for dignity, for our communities, ensuring that no one is left in no one is left behind once and for all. Thank you so much, Dominique, and back to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Kanam, and, uh, for setting the stage for this conversation. And thank you also for your important work. So we're now going to dive into our moderated dialogue. Each member of the panel will have six minutes to answer a question, and we'll ask panelists to please stay within your allotted time to give everyone the chance to have meaningful participation and so we can get to a second round. So Dr. Beckles, we will start with you. Um, 20 years ago, Professor Beckles, the Durban Declaration requested states to invest in communities of African descent. Among other sectors, it included education. As an educator and as a leader, in, as a thought leader in this area, what are your views on the progress that has been made to ensure communities of African descent have access to quality education? Uh, you're still on mute, Dr. Beckles. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Dominique. Thank you, um, all colleagues. Uh, tremendous honor and pleasure to be a part of this of this program, and to and to reflect on where we have reached uh, since Durban 2001. In respect of the the issue of access to education, uh, higher education especially, uh, access to college, university, uh, skills, skills training and professional development. I need to make uh, one or two general statements uh, on the theme. First of all, we recognize from the historical evidence that the African journey through uh, Western modernity uh, has been characterized by a massive uh, criminal de-education experience and that the African population was de-educated, it was de-skilled and it was de-professionalized and that was the objective of the structures of colonial exploitation of, of African, of uh, enslaved African labor. So the, the general process was that millions of Africans uh, went through a four or 500 year period of being de-skilled, being uh, de-educated. And in fact, uh, being afraid to, to uh, uh, for education uh, because mass illiteracy in the various languages of the colonizers was uh, the projected policy norm. So Africans were not expected to demonstrate literacy, numeracy, or to show intellectual proclivity. And all of those were very dangerous indeed from the point of view of such an African being seen as part of a resistance, a resistance strategy. So Africans therefore were placed in this long intergenerational process of being uh, placed in a context where to express intellectual capacity was, was dangerous. It was criminalized and therefore black people generally were detached from the educational structures and systems. And thus we, 
we have this massive problem at the moment uh, with the state of condition in respect to access to education by black people uh, across, across the Atlantic world. Here in the Caribbean, uh, for example, where I am an educator, uh, I'm involved in uh, driving access revolution to education in general. The black people in the Caribbean, uh, within the context of the hemisphere, uh, we have the lowest enrollment in higher education. So if you take Alaska, to Argentina, the entire hemisphere, and we look at where this region is with a massive uh, uh, 80% African descendant population. This group of people within the age cohort 18 to 30, which is the younger generation, the young people have the lowest enrollment in higher education in the entire hemisphere. And we're speaking about young black people in a hemisphere that is galloping towards economic transformation, digital development, uh, professional training, access to technical and other artistic intellectual skills. So within the context of skills access, professional development, academic training, we continue 100 plus years after emancipation to be in a situation of being at the bottom of access to education in the hemisphere. Now, I am sure that in the U.S. context in the South, in those, those uh, post-plantation economies, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and so on, I'm sure the data would give us the same circumstance as the data would point to the same situation in Brazil and other parts of Latin America, Colombia, and so on. So in the Atlantic world, Black people are generally outside of the mainstream, detached from access to education, professional development and skills training, despite intergenerational development since emancipation. So this was a problem that was discussed at Durban. This was the issue that was addressed at Durban. This was the resolution. There was a resolution focused around that concept that the only way that the black people of the world and the Americas in general are going to have community development, family development, and to build up the infrastructure of black civilization with access to education and, and public health, and the two are connected. We did not see any significant Sorry. movement, simply because there has been a major pushback. There is no doubt that the, the Western nation states, uh, the, the post-colonial states, the states that uh, on chattel slavery, there is a tremendous back and indifference That's among these states. Right. And we see this in the deck and the years since Durban. So post Durban, I would say that the response Sorry. by states across the Atlantic world and beyond, that the response has been anemic. There's no, there has been no enthusiasm. There has been no policy framework that drives this agenda. And what we're looking at is resistance resistance to the philosophy and the culture embedded in the Durban Declaration. Oh uh, it is still a, a, a palpable objection among the corporate class, among the leaders of the nation state to address this fundamental issue. And we see this everywhere okay. that we have examined no, and collected okay. data. So um, it is clear that we are going to need more than a decade to deal with the African descendant issue. We're going to need a second decade. And we are advocating that the one decade is given the resistance, given the depth of the problem, given the enormity of the problem, it will take 10 years even to thaw, to thaw the resistance and begin to turn this around to have action in the subsequent decade. So those of us who are uh, in the activist agenda are pushing for a second decade. We are calling for a very frank conversation in the UN, that is the custodian of the Durban Declaration, to have a deep dive to get to the bottom of what has been going on since, since Durban. I know that conversation is likely to happen at the UN next week, and we are asking many of our uh, uh, leaders who are going to uh, have access to the floor of the General Assembly to insist upon these things. This is a matter 
of the democratic rights of African peoples in the 21st century. And therefore the reparatory justice agenda has to be the critical focus around which this matter of access to education is addressed. It has to be placed at the center of a reparatory justice framework that this is about reparations, access to development, community development, intergenerational development, access to, to assets of, of wealth, to end the plunder, to repair the plunder that has been taken out of the community so that communities can also self repair. So all of this is an integrated dialogue and at the heart of it is access to education and good public health care. The two cannot be separated, one leads to another. If you are not properly educated, you would not understand the need to take care of public health. If you're not properly educated in terms of the basic sciences of how the body functions, of how one should take care of nutrition and one's health, then the pandemic of chronic diseases that has ripped through the Black community of the Americas, that is a consequence also of not being able to self repair because you don't have the tools to do so. So if we take the simple criterion of chronic diseases, let's say the chronic diseases criterion, if you take that one simple criterion, then the black people of this hemisphere are the sickest people in the world. The black people in this hemisphere using the criterion of non-communicable chronic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, and so on. We are the sickest people in the world Dr. because Beckles. of this. And therefore, a lot of work has to be done. We, we, we have not made uh, any significant progress to speak of, and it has to be shouldered to the wheel and pressing on for another decade. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beckles. And, and I invite everyone to think about what it means, as Dr. Beckles says, that this anemic response to the right to education, to the call for education in Durban, um, education, the core transmission of knowledge has been so wholly um, criminalized, disinvested in, um, stripped of people of African descent. So thank you for that important intervention. I'd like to turn now to uh, Ms. Susanna Baca um, and ask a, a question of you. At the time of the acceptance of your post as a cabinet minister in 2011, you vowed to combat discrimination against indigenous peoples and peoples of African descent. As we mark the 20th anniversary of Durban, can you reflect on what progress has been made in the implementation of the Durban program of action in your country, in Peru? Good morning, everyone, once again. I especially appreciate the opportunity to share this panel with you. I think that you are in the same, you maintain that willingness to express yourselves from your experiences and about our hopes, dreams, and our Latin American surroundings. And regarding the question that was asked in the panel about my promises and combating discrimination against indigenous peoples, Afro-descendants, when assuming the role of minister, I had the challenge as Minister of Culture under my duties of fundamental categories such as the Vice Ministry of Interculturality, which establishes by mandate of the national constitution the visibility, the visibility of Afro-descendant Amazonian and indigenous peoples. All these political aspects converged. They had a common axis, the fight against discrimination and the fight against social, cultural and economic exclusion. This is how we started our management. In a few days, an intercultural dialogue began. Our agenda included the meeting at all levels of the ministries with the presence of the representatives of all the communities assigned for this dialogue, and everything seemed to be heading in a very good way. 
Our agenda of principles at that time was very clear. We must fight for the law of prior consultation. What does this law mean? I think we all know, but I can tell you that it is a very important law in my country. At that time, a huge misfortune had happened. There was a confrontation between the Amazon community and the police. They asked that they were to be consulted prior to doing any work within their community, in the area of their community, or on the land of their community. So, the oil and mining companies had to meet with the community and tell them what were they going to do. But they had concerns about environmental contamination. Then the central government issued two decrees and that was it. People got very upset. After that, the law of prior consultation was going around in Congress and finally that year in 2011, it was approved unanimously by the Congress and it was my job as the Ministry of Culture to implement it so the law can be enforced. I don't know what other word to use. So, so the law can be enforced and that people should have the right to demonstrate against or in favor of the intervention in their communities. Then we also saw that the role of education in the prevention of racial prejudice and the need to guarantee progress in the integration of the gender perspective in the measures and programs adopted to avoid racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and other ways with these intolerances in accordance with Durban. The creation of the Observatory Against Racism, as soon as I returned from the meeting after Durban, was a meeting in Brazil, and I returned from there. And I was attending that meeting, representing my country as a minister, and also in representation of the president, as he could not assist. Then there was great enthusiasm for this. We thought that this would achieve many things. Upon my return, it was proposed that the creation of the Observatory Against Racism should contain disaggregated statistical data for the formulation and implementation of public policies against racism. But when I left the ministry, things were left the way they were. And well, the other ministers have been working on this little by little. But I had great hope that racism would keep on reducing in the country. However, that has not happened. On the contrary, I have now been a member of the Court of Honor of the Ethical Pact in the elections in Peru. And I have been able to see closely the times that women have faced discrimination. Oh, that's terrible. Discrimination because they're women. Discrimination against people who live in indigenous villages because of the way they speak and how 
they've wanted to change the course of the elections by making up a series of issues. So I have come to the conclusion that we have made little progress. And it is as the previous panelist, Professor Hillary, said that education is essential to ensure that our countries stop discriminating against people because of their belief, because of their skin color, because of the way they speak. And so, in these moments, in these times of the pandemic, it requires expanding our mission and that the struggles for equality and the search for absolute politics, intolerance or racism must expand its gaze to fight against the lack of solidarity of the developed cities compared to the undeveloped or less developed ones. Since this is a more significant trait in a country like Peru, where more than one official policy discriminates against a black, an indigenous, or even an Amazonian. It is the in indolence of a population that allows and creates unequal environments where the latter could live in misery, famine, with lack of education and capacity, lack of access to health technologies, it would be necessary to first develop policies in general that are felt by the broad sectors of the general population of Peru and thus only develop policies to combat the evils of discrimination and racism within these same communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Varka. So thank you very much. I, you know, our working group did a country visit to Peru uh, right before the pandemic. And I think we really saw firsthand what you've talked about, which is the commitment that one person can show in bringing and leading change and how, um, how that shifts, how individual leadership makes a big difference, but the lack of a cohesive race analysis can really limit the progress a country or a community can make. Um, and we thank you for your work, um, having seen some of it firsthand. All right, why don't we continue with our panel? Um, Dr. Marta Moreno Vega, uh, perhaps I could ask you a question in a moment. Let me start by introducing um, uh, sort of the second major theme here, the Durban Declaration recognizes the value of cultural heritage of Africans and people of African descent. Um, you have uh, done extensive work for the preservation and expansion of knowledge of African diaspora tradition. How can we use this cultural heritage to advance the Durban uh, uh, agenda specifically and to advance equality and rights for people of African descent more generally? Dr. Vega. And also, Dr. Vega, you are on mute. You can unmute yourself. Or perhaps the moderator can help and unmute Dr. Vega. I think I did it. Muy buena, buenos dias, good day. I speak to you from Puerto Rico, a colony of the United States. I think that um, I would like to um, address some of the points made so I can uh, then address what the question is. I think that one of the assumptions that we make is that education was created to educate us as a professor, as a university professor, as a cultural activist. One of the realities is that education or the educational system was not designed to educate us. As uh, Sir Beckel said, um, we have been through a process of miseducation and deeducation. So that if we're going to speak about change, we have to speak about systemic 
in, uh, process of building Europeans, building institutions to maintain white supremacy, to maintain privilege. And the question becomes, what institutions are we building in the process to assure that we can pass on the cultural intelligences that our people have brought? And how then does that influence our seeing ourselves differently, our, our being able to structure different strategies that will empower us? We have to uh, understand, like in the United States and throughout the world, eugenics, a science was developed to prove that we are not intelligent. And that premise and that thinking still exists. If we look at the recent ha happenings within the United States, the suppression of the vote, the suppression of education, critical uh, race theory, uh, teaching of history of our people, in 2021 is an absolute crime. So that when we speak about education, we have to be clear as to what education are we speaking about? Do we control it? What education do we control for our young, for our young adults, so that they can see themselves differently, identify their intelligence and their right to being human? So the process of culture is critical and we can't put it aside as a thing. Our, the way we see ourselves, the way we understand the food that we eat, the way that we understand the intelligence that our people have brought and continue to practice, almost invisible to some of us, right? And I've been privileged, and I say I've been privileged because growing up in East Harlem, my parents coming from Puerto Rico, a colony, insisted that I was beautiful and Black. And in that process, insisted that I travel. So the opportunity to travel to Africa, to see ourselves in Trinidad, to see ourselves in Brazil, to see ourselves in Santo Domingo, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and I can go on. You see a continuity of aesthetics. You see a continuity of aesthetic thought. You see a continuity of intelligence in terms of how you use nature to heal because we all come from tropical countries, from countries where the earth has nourished us. And in the process, we have to understand, as I said before, and I think that we have to put that at the center of our discussion, the institutions that have been developed to keep us marginalized, to keep us from gaining the wealth that we worked for, for in, under enforced labor for European colonial powers. And that is still a process in 2021, because where we were outlawed from owning land in Brazil, where we were outlawed from owning land in Puerto Rico and in Cuba, right? Uh, um, now in the United States, for example, redlining uh, doesn't allow you to gain wealth with the purchases that you have, because if you buy a home in a community, automatically the value of the properties go down. So that there is a system in place that we have to call out. We have to call out colonialism and the ravages of colonialism and white supremacy. We have to call out the miseducation of our young, the purposeful miseducation of our young. I've been, once I understood that process, being a public school teacher have been intentional in building community-based cultural organizations because we have to start somewhere. I don't stop being a professor, but I also understand that we have to develop those sacred spaces, those safe spaces that teach our own, that nourish our own, that say to our young, you are powerful and beautiful that say to our young, you are intelligent. And if we don't do that, who will? Thank you, Dr. I can't argue that a white supremacy continues to want its power, but I have to argue that we need to gain our power. And I'm not sure that it's within those systems that purposely were built to keep us poor 
and on the margins. Thank you. So Dr. that we have yeah. to rethink, we have to rethink how we think. Yeah. And part of that process, and I'll close with that. And part of that process is that we have maintained sacred thought. And if you go to Trinidad, you go to Brazil, you go to Jamaica, you go to Santo Domingo, invisible to the general public are traditions that we maintain that intelligence, that maintain that way of thinking, of building community, of sustaining community, and using nature as healing powers. So how is it that we don't incorporate that in the strategy for liberation? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vega. And it's always such a pleasure to be on a panel with you because I think your work really exposing and dismantling and, and offering new imaginations around the systems of our lives is so important and so foundational. Um, and you do it in community. So uh, thank you thank for your work. For the opportunity. So I think we have uh, Professor Maloney now. If, uh, just to remind everybody, we've been talking with Professor Maloney about the underrepresentation or absence of people of African descent from decision-making spaces, including the decisions that structure our lives. And um, Professor Maloney, please help us understand what measures can be taken by government to ensure full and meaningful, particip full and meaningful participation of people of African descent. Professor Maloney. Well, I would like, first of all, to place myself onto this whole process, to be able to compare and make an evaluation of the evolution of the movement from the commitment of the Durban Declaration and the Plan of Action. My reference are the decades of the 70s and 80s in America when the Congress of Black Cultures occurred in America, the first one by Manuel Zapata Oliveira, who retook the effectiveness of the Congress and the global vision of Malcos Galvich. During that decade, Zapata restarted this process and the first Congress of Black Cultures in the Americas was held in Cali. Then in 1980, it was held in Panama, and in 1983, it was held in Brazil. And for the first time, we would say that we met with intellectuals, writers, researchers, the most prominent on the continent at that time. I'm talking about Rex Nettleford from Jamaica, Edward Camus Brathwaite, I'm talking about John Casimir from Haiti. I'm talking about Nicomedo and Victoria Santa Cruz from Peru. I'm talking about Robert Allen and Robert Hill from the United States, of Nelson Estupiñan Bas and Salomon Chala from Ecuador, of Olala Bernard from Costa Rica, Armando Crisanto Melendez from Honduras, Armando Entralgo from Cuba, Bryce Laporte from the United States, Panamanian. I believe that moment was so decisive because we designed a roadmap to try to find an answer to the problem and sufferings of Afro-Americans throughout the continent. Obviously, for us, the actors in the process, when the Durban Conference was approved and held, the impact was great because we realized that states around the world had made a commitment to formally join a struggle that had been the guiding principle of life for many of us. So, I think it is important to be clear that the Durban Plan of Action, despite of establishing economic, social, political, and cultural commitments, these commitments have not reached the expected levels. However, progress has been significant. In the most part, for some states, 
and due to the responsible actions of the United Nations and the Afro-descendant community itself, there have been significant transformations. For example, because of Durban, there are states where institutional spaces within the state have been achieved by law, such as Brazil, Ecuador, Panama, Costa Rica, and Colombia. Durban has also represented an interesting strengthening of Afro-descendant social movements. In Central America, for example, the honest existence and the coordinating role that occurs, especially in the Afro-descendant grassroots movement in the region, is very important. The articulation and growth of black women's organizations on the continent is also a result of Durban. The development of youth organizations on the continent also, I think, is a very important achievement that shows a significant level of maturity of African descendants. It is also important how Durban has influenced, for example, in countries that have always had an Afro population but never gave any kind of importance to it, and they began to give it the connotation and value that this deserves. I'm referring to the case of Mexico, for example, the case of Bolivia, and the case of Salvador, for example. I believe these are very specific aspects of maturity and expansion of the essence of the movement within the basis of civil society. Obviously, the influence that Durban has created on the movement and the development of the levels of consciousness in places in Europe, especially in Spain, for example, is very important. In recent years, Spain has developed a very important level of organization coordinated with Latin America, but also coordinated with African countries themselves. I think the Black Lives Matter campaign has a lot to do with that. Virtuality, a product of the pandemic, has also provided social networks with a central role in making visible the problem of racism and discrimination, opening an important space for a number of academic and cultural events, but also for complaints and acts of solidarity. However, it seems to me that being greatly influenced by the scope of events, the most important achievements throughout this period has been the strengthening of identity. In other words, the recognition and rescue of what our cultural heritage is directly from Africa. This has been, in my opinion, of great value because it has stimulated the development of an ethnic consciousness which is perhaps one of the very important results throughout the scope and of Durban. However, the fact that the greatest emphasis has been on stimulating and strengthening awareness, I believe that it has not prioritized in the same manner as social measures and goals the social demands in terms of education, technology, and health. In any case, I think the pandemic demonstrated that the effect of the states not given enough value to it, importance, and should have decided to carry out intercultural policies where there is respect for citizenship regardless of the ethnic condition. I believe the pandemic showed the levels of inequality 
that still exist in the region that are important to overcome. I believe that for a transformation to occur through the creation of a new global system, equality, democracy, and sustainability must be the central pillars in any strategy to solve the problems of intolerance, discrimination, and racism that still persist in the continents and the world. Thank you, Dr. Maloney. Um, and thank you for this important intervention. I think we have seen in the pandemic the impact of decision-making that excludes people of African descent from meaningful participation and the importance, as you say, of looking at it in very local context. Um, I think at this point, we'd like to bring in our final panelist, uh, Ana Paula Barreto. Um, uh, welcome. And let me just ask, uh, offer you this to reflect upon. Women and girls suffer multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. And we've seen how that perpetuates a cycle of intergenerational poverty. Empowering women and girls, including through access to quality sexual and reproductive health rights, is a powerful tool to end this cycle um, and, and contributes to the advancement of the Durban agenda. In what ways can governments and civil society organizations support the empowerment of women and girls of African descent? Thank you so much, Dominique. Uh, it's truly an honor to participate in such a crucial uh, discussion. Um, this is a, a highly important question as the states uh, have the responsibility to protect and to promote our human rights and civil society actors, uh, key stakeholders uh, in the development of a comprehensive response to the advancement of the Durban Agenda, as well as the International Decade for People of African Descent. And I would like to share uh, a couple of comments uh, regarding to this point. Uh, in my opinion, the collection of disaggregated data is key when we are thinking about uh, the different oppressions and the multiple and intersection forms of inequalities and discriminations that uh, women and girls face. Um, is it important to, to fight the structural discrimination and racism and governments need to take disaggregated data as part of their natural or regular strategic planning that they do every year? By promoting a national and a local strategic planning that adds delegated data, states are making what is invisible visible. And uh, we all know the impacts of racism globally. However, when we are looking at delegated data, we can see how deep and how cruel the systems of oppressions are and how they affect the daily lives of our people uh, every day. And when we are thinking about uh, income, wealth, education, health, uh, access to justice, or, or even dignity. Um, Disaggregated data bring light to the maintain segregation, exclusion, and inequality that many of our communities face every day. States should also recognize their historical responsibilities and actions regarding to structural systems of oppression uh, of the past and of today. Uh, the history of slavery, the transatlantic slave trade and reparations are essential part of this process as well. Um, these aggregated data are necessarily for governments to take meaningful and impactful uh, actions if they wanna move towards a really and truly uh, just and equal world. We also, delegated data uh, helps to governments to achieve the sustainable development goals that and when we are also thinking about situations that go beyond the material conditions, we also need to recognize the many and diverse contributions of people of African descent to societies around the world. Um, as Januaro Garcia, a very important black Brazilian photographer used to say, there is a history of black people without Brazil, However, there is no history of Brazil without black people. And talking about Brazil, the country where I'm from, Brazil has well collected, developed and analyzed regulated data 
uh, when we are thinking about the situation of, of African descent, uh, including uh, when we are thinking about health. And I wanna mention that Brazil and the US are the only countries in the Americas that do disaggregated data uh, on health indicators. Um, it is due to disaggregated data that we can understand uh, how unequal Brazil is. And I would like to share uh, just two examples. Uh, in Sao Paulo, the city where I'm from, uh, people who are poor or, and live in poor areas uh, are 10 times more likely to die from COVID than people that live in wealthy areas. Black Sao Paulo residents are also 62% more likely to die from COVID than white residents. Uh, Brazil also unfortunately has the highest maternal mortality case due to COVID in the world. 77% of pregnant women that die due to COVID are Brazilians. I also would you like to share some important uh, disaggregated data when we are thinking about the different violence that women and girls face. When we are thinking about reproductive justice and sexual and reproductive rights, we also need to think about sexual violence, but also political violence, as well as um, economic violence that women and girls face, including, I wanna share, when we are thinking about uh, police brutality. Um, Brazil today has more than 20 million COVID cases. And unfortunately, we are reaching about 60, 100,000 people that die. However, police brutality persists and actually increased during the COVID times. Um, and I wanna share uh, my last uh, data that says that according to the Fogo Cruzado platform, since 2017, the only the real police, not only the national police as a, as a whole, but in one city of Brazil, more than 700 women, including 15 pregnant women were killed by the, the real police. And, and here, I would like to mention the name of Kathleen Romeo. She was 24 years old. She was going to visit her grandmother when she got shot uh, in Rio, which, which promoted a, a series of national protests around the country. And to finalize my, my comment, I, was, I also would like to mention that children, especially girls, also suffer uh, from police brutality. Between 2017 and 2019, the Brazilian police killed more than 2,000 children, including several little girls and babies. And this is also part of the reproductive justice framework. To finalize, I would like to say the name of three little girls that were killed by the Brazilian police when they were playing in front of their house. Jennifer Gomez, 11 years old. Agatha Vitoria, eight years old. Kathleen Oliveira Gomez, five years old. Thank you so much. Anabella, thank you so much for this important, important uh, contribution. I think we are in a space where we make assumptions about universality. I have been hearing for a year and a half now how COVID affects everybody, how it affects people equally. And we hear it despite clear data that shows racial disparities, um, despite clear data that's showing the accompaniment of police brutality with, um, against some of the people at the highest risk for, for COVID. And we've seen, as you're saying, this, this tragic and unforgivable impact to children. Um, so I appreciate your focus on data in this context because it doesn't always seem uh, like it pulls at your heart, but it's the only way that we are seen in some of these spaces. Uh, we have actually now a short statement from Dr. Carl Austin, a faith leader who defends human rights. Dr. Austin is the co-founder of the Human Reproduction Research Center of Gorgas Memorial Institute for Health Studies in Panama. Uh, let's... Uh, take a look at Dr. Austin's statement, and then we'll move into our poem that we talked about earlier. I'm Dr. Carl L. Austin, a reproductive endocrinologist, obstetrician, gynecologist. There are three fundamental points that I would like to emphasize. There has been a lot of documentation about the situation and status of migrants. This persists today and perhaps even worse. 
There is a concept about in-person education. Although the pandemic did not exist at that time, there was a vision of presenting the points related to these. And then there are aspects related to slavery, human trafficking, the situation with sex trade that still persists despite the years that have passed since this report to this day. These topics are still present and very present in our daily lives. Hello beautiful people and hello people from African descent. I am Vicky the Point, your Afro Point. I would like to thank Dr. Natalia for this wonderful opportunity. Today I'll be performing a poem entitled being black is gold, living in dark is thin of the old. Sit, relax, and enjoy as I perform. Across the Atlantic, there lies an ageless, gallant land called Africa. She is dressed with untold riches and her dressed with the tradition of the ancients, a land caressed with brave mysteries and embraced by tamed nature. Her footprints have been a torch in tunnels and direction signs at every turn end. Her tall mountains, adoring savannas, Upright trees, stretching and covering rivers are only a pinch of her tasty meal. In her children, she breathes life. And the legacy of her valiant warriors, she embalms for a lifetime. Her sons and fearless daughters build the Western Empire with a tool called unity, with just their bare hands. Her uniqueness was extracted from blackness. No wonder she glows even in darkness. She has survived the rage out of Noah's ark. She has withstood speed from angry dragons and amidst the thorns she still stood her ground and never let go of her supreme crown. She is the home of the sun, but these days her clouds is robed in darkness. From afar, she seems lack, but what is stuck in her bosom is like an oxygen so sufficient for us all to share. This day she bleeds with her sisters across the Pacific to be specific Asia, Europe, North America, South America, Antarctica, Oceania, and Australia. They cried endlessly because they have been tied with indestructible rope by their sons and daughters. To make this world once again a better place and to stitch smile on her crying face, let us turn our back to this world that a strange unity of our entity, a world that chooses colors over hearts, a world that has no value for nature. A world nurturing its own destruction. Pack your bags, grab your things, and flee with me from this world and banish its thoughts. Let us go back to the old ways and borrow the tool called unity from our ancestors. Let us replace a device called me with an engine called we. Let us melt our differences with the very heat that cook our hatred. Our colors might be different.
different, but our hearts beat the same. Our ways might be unique in their ways, but our lungs breathe the same. What is meant for all should not be given to few. The birds, they are of different colors, shapes and size, but they own and dwell in the sky in harmony. No wonder where I came from, very early in the morning, they do sing songs of harmony and pleasant melody. Let go of your abode, withdraw the keys from your wall and unlock your heart. Fill its room with love and oneness. Let go of your feast and open your hands for embrace. In your eyes, what is yours I will see as mine. And in my eyes, what is mine you will see as yours. I am yours truly, Vicky. Thank you, UNFPA Sierra Leone. So. Yes, yes. So thank you, Vicky, for um, for sharing with us this moment of, of culture. Uh, we would like to close out our panel with just a closing thought from each panelist. You get 60 seconds. I realize this is almost criminal, yet I'm going to ask folks to really just give us one closing thought and uh, uh, as, as we move to the final uh, closing sessions, uh, we'll start with Ana Paula Barreto. Uh, Ana? Uh, that's so difficult to start. All right, thank you. Well, first, I would like to thank uh, for this opportunity. I really want to say that when we are thinking about people of African descent and structural forms of oppression, we cannot put ourselves in boxes. So we, can, we need to think beyond the boxes and when we're thinking about reproductive justice, everything is about reproductive justice. So police violence, uh, sexual violence, political violence, that's, that's, that's all connected. And I really would like to see us moving to this framework. Thank you. Powerful. Thank you. Dr. Marta Moreno Vega. Well, um, in keeping with Durban vision, right, of culture, I think that we need to understand that the ashe that we have carried to all of our communities and distributed throughout our uh, neighborhoods and families, and it persists, that we need to weave together a way of seeing ourselves that is different and build institutions that are based in that aesthetic, in our way of seeing the world. It doesn't mean we give up our jobs someplace else because we all need to survive. But the reality is if we don't build our own, we remain with the same conversations over and over again, because these other institutions were designed to maintain white supremacy and keep the other on the margins. Amazing, so true, amazing. Uh, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, a closing thought. Oh, we may have lost Professor Beckles now. Oh, no, okay. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dominique. I believe it's going to be important to step up our advocacy in much the same way that we did in the build up to Durban. There was a lot of work we did in the, in the year or two before Durban. We now need to step up that global advocacy once again around the issue for a second decade and to focus on education, public health as critical. So we have to have a strong advocacy movement demanding the second decade. Already Caribbean prime ministers are talking about this. They're speaking at the UN next week. These are some of the ideas that are going to be on the agenda at the UN. So all of us should rally to keep the focus around the post Durban declarations. Amazing. Thank you, Professor Beckles. Ms. Thank Baca? You. Uh, a closing thought, 60 seconds, please. A few days ago, I was just watching the CARICOM Summit in Africa, and it caught my attention because I believe that part of the path that we need to travel is just that, 
we need to create a strong continent because that continent is part of the solution of the problems that we continue to face here in the diaspora. I think it is important that we are not just Afro-descendants because we come from Africa, rather Africa is within all of us. That's beautiful, Africa is within us. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Maloney. Uh, uh, Susana Baca, a closing thought, if you will, for one minute. And I think you need to unmute or perhaps the moderator can help you and unmute for you. Great, go yeah. ahead, Ms. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, please go ahead. I remember from what we lived many years. November 18, 2001. No, 2011, I'm sorry. So we continued down that path and we persisted, all of us, all the Afro descendant and diaspora leaders, all of us. We all defended our identity, our d diversity, because here in Peru, we have mixed tremendously with the Chinese, the indigenous people, among Afro-descendants. So there is a tremendous diversity, which is a richness. And this richness is present in all of our manifestations, in our artistic manifestations, in transmitting culture to the world. And it also makes us a difficult country, difficult. And we go through very strong political crisis, like the last one we have experienced, where we saw discrimination against women, against indigenous people, against Amazonians, against Afro-descendants, against those different beliefs every single day. And then we continue fighting in my world until our last breath that we may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Baca, very much. Um, there is so much strength in our diversity and also it is such a space to, to keep negotiating. I'd like to thank you all for this important conversation. Uh, uh, we would ask Dr. Kenam for some closing remarks uh, to really um, uh, round out this important dialogue. Dr. Kenam, if you're, available, if you're, if you're there, please do uh, take the floor. Thank you so much, Dominique. This has been an outstanding set of discussions in this global dialogue. The momentum is building towards leaving no one behind. And the list is long. And Afrodescendientes are on the list, strategizing with others. As Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, said regarding the historic first day, international day for people of African descent. Quote, acknowledging the entrenched legacy of enslavement, redressing the wrongs of history, and shattering the evil lie of supremacy demands persistence and action every day, at every level, in every society. End quote. So as we reflect and as we mark the 20th anniversary of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. It is clear that we've had successes, but we also have to thank those of you who persevere in the understanding that we can never lose sight of the injustice and the suffering that still exists for many people of African descent across the globe. The General Assembly debate will take place on the 22nd of September regarding the 20th of Durban. And CARICOM is leading 
in that discussion, and we thank them, while noting that 2024 is drawing closer and closer. And that is the close of the current decade of action. So now that the permanent forum of people of African descent has been established unanimously, we must also acknowledge that continuing the push for collective investments in those programs, in those policies, in that legislation that will advance the rights of people of African descent is of eminent and imminent importance, especially as we demand equal treatment during a pandemic, whereas we've heard repeatedly people of African descent have suffered disproportionately. I would like to acknowledge the leadership from the government of Costa Rica in particular, the vision of the president and the vice president, Madame Epsi Campbell Barr, for global leadership in establishing the historic first International Day for people of African descent, which was celebrated in conjunction with uh, participants from Africa. Lastly, young people who have been a catalyst for much, much of the momentum we have seen over the millennia need to be promoted as they continue to make clear that peace and justice go hand in hand. I must also acknowledge and praise the valiant leadership of those warrior women who have kept racial and reproductive justice high on our agenda. At the Nairobi summit marking the 25th anniversary of ICPD, the world made political commitments, financial commitments, and policy commitments to leave no one behind and to reach the furthest behind first, specifically all people of African descent. And I believe that while we move forward, the intersecting forms of discrimination continue to endanger lives and livelihood speak to a moment where we have to continue to galvanize action, where we need to continue to go together with people of African descent, indigenous peoples, migrants, people living with disabilities, people living with HIV and AIDS, and especially women, girls, and young people to see a successful close to this urgent priority to assure that people of African descent will lead rather than being left behind. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kanam, for this important, important wrap up that you've given us. Uh, so as we close out uh, and sort of bask in the words of our panelists and of Natalia Kanam, I'm gonna invite you to watch a short documentary, it's just about five minutes, entitled Back to Our Roots, followed by a musical performance of the same name. It's set in the paradise of Cauita on the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica. And it tells how Calypso music became the, the voice of a growing people uh, as a symbol of protest and struggle. The song performed by the group Calypso Cauita from Costa Rica, it's written by Danny Williams. And it speaks of the importance of recovering our roots, our cultures and our traditions and keeping the memories of our ancestors alive. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank, uh, my most sincere thanks to our panelists, to Dr. Natalia Kanam, and to all of you for your engagement in this incredibly important dialogue on the 20th anniversary of Durban. And please do sit back and watch um, the documentary and the musical performance to close us out. <laughs> El Calypso viene de nuestros antepasados leanos. Es una herencia ancestral, musical, que considero que se debe preservar. Cuando hablamos del Calypso, estamos hablando de mi historia. El Calipso es la historia de un pueblo que vino creciendo. Entonces, muchas veces cuando uno quiere saber de su historia, lo único que tiene que hacer es sentarse a escuchar música. En nuestro caso, el Calipso. Para mí, 
el calipso era la voz de un pueblo que hablaba. Era una protesta, era como alzar la voz de lo que estaba pasando realmente. Desde nuestra existencia hemos tenido que estar en una lucha permanente. Número uno, la esclavitud. Número dos, la discriminación. Los afro o los negros han sido minoría tanto en la educación, en las oportunidades. Entonces debe ser una lucha, lucha constante. Claro, el racismo todavía está. La falta de acceso, las desigualdades, todo eso está y van a seguir persistiendo. Entonces, muchas veces para nosotros poder obtener lo que necesitamos, hay que alzar la voz. Y es muy necesario que las personas afrodescendientes lo hagan, pues es la forma en la que podemos lograr nuestra libertad. Es que antes de hablar de afrodescendientes, hablamos de seres humanos porque todos somos seres humanos y, y lo que tratamos de hacer con esto es que no haya división por, mi, por el color de mi piel, sino que todos somos hijos de, de un Dios. Soy felizmente una joven afrocostarricense y saber que llevo mi país en mi corazón, en mi mente y en mi lucha y decir que soy afrocostarricense me llena de orgullo. Yo celebro estas fechas con amor, con gritos, con cantos, porque es, es, es un día que me representa, es un día que representa a mi pueblo, es un día que representa mi lucha y mi libertad. A mí me emociona escribir de nuestra historia, Mahatma. Y siento que, que la unión es parte de cualquier ser humano que quiere avanzar hacia lo positivo. My people, our people, get back to our roots. We have to unite. Because it's the only way we can win the fight. Entonces, cuando se habla de, de unite, de unirnos, es por luchar por nuestros derechos en un buen sentido de la palabra. No vamos a hacer guerra, no vamos a pelear. Y siempre con cosas positivas, con ritmos alegres, porque sentimos que, que, que la música alegra el alma. Sentimos que el calipso está con su efervescencia y necesitamos ese, ese empujón para mantenerlo con vida y así vamos a tener viva la memoria de nuestros antepasados. Thank you.